Hello again, Gooners. It's the Loose Cannon number 80 something, not too sure. Um, what am I going to talk about today? I'll tell you what. Um, yeah, the good times are back again. Let the good times roll, as somebody once said. Um, going to be talking about my predictions. I know that's boring, but I will talk about it anyway. I'll tell you what, it's not boring. Peter's story. I found, um, I found a book that's got an article on Peter's story. I'll be reading it for the first time. Excitement? No, perhaps not. I'm excited about it. You should be. I'll tell you what is exciting though, £15 million pounds, Arsenal about to spend that on a Bundesliga superstar, superstarlet, we don't buy superstars usually, or do we, Podolski of course, last last summer, and uh, obviously Cazorla, we bought a lot of good players last summer, perhaps not quite enough, anyway, there's one player who could be coming our way, I'll talk about him briefly later, um, be talking about the Fulham game, of course that's the most recent game that uh, that we've managed to get three points from talk about that talk about the managerial situation there's a couple of possibilities somebody could be coming in to take Arsene Wenger's place I'll talk about that briefly I, I have to say and also about the possibility of one of our managerial staff moving elsewhere uh, perhaps two of our managerial staff moving elsewhere I'll talk about that too if I remember and plus the latest on Jack Wilshire so quite a lot to get through um, don't know how long it will take. I'll, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Well, first of all, of course, um, my predictions. That's the most important thing. Or is it? No, Fulham. That's the most important thing. We've got the three points there. Uh, this ties in with my predictions because I said we would get three points away at Fulham. I also said we'd beat Everton, which we didn't do. But based on the games that I predicted, the six games, we've come in with exactly the number of points that I predicted. The bad news is I predicted we'd lose to Manchester United beat QPR, beat Wigan and draw against Newcastle, which would give us 70 points. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be bad news because at the beginning of my predictions, I was saying we will get into fourth place, but it will be tight, I said. We'd probably tie with Liverpool. I was completely wrong about that. Liverpool have fallen by the wayside. Luckily, Everton obviously resurgent now, apart from losing against Sunderland, which brings me on to Tottenham's last game, of course, against Sunderland. I put that down as a three, point win, uh, three points for Tottenham. I still go with that. I still go with that prediction, but I didn't know about the Paolo Di Canio factor. So that may influence things down there at White Hart Lane. So you never know. Perhaps uh, Spurs will drop points. At the moment, prior to this weekend, they were, they were actually getting less points than I predicted. But now they're on more points because they beat Manchester City. So they've got two points more than I was predicting. Which means, unfortunately, from my predictions, it means if they continue uh, in the vein that I predicted, they'd end up with 71 points, which is one point more than us. And then as far as Chelsea are concerned, they're doing a little bit worse than, than I expected, and that would see them finish with 73 points, which means we could miss out. So I'm hoping my predictions uh, are, less, are, less, um, <laughs> are less right than they have been up till now. Um, I was going to show you this with all my predictions, but... No, I think I think we've had enough of that. I'll tell you what, though, um, we never get tired of discussing victories, but I would I would say we have to be very cautious about uh, getting carried away by the latest victory. Obviously, we've had a lot of good results. We are slowing down. The momentum isn't quite what it was, but we're still getting results. Chesney's come back in goal, keeping clean sheets. Got to be pleased about that. Um, I've been pleased with Fabianski, although he's now injured with a with a cracked rib. So how long he's going to be out for, I don't know, but some time. And, and if he is ready to come back, can he replace Chesney? Obviously not. If Chesney's keeping clean sheets, he's got to stay in goal. Did Chesney command the um, six-yard box? Reasonably well. He did reasonably well. He did concede a goal which was disallowed against Fulham. Uh, perhaps there was a bit of element of luck in that. One thing we weren't lucky with was Olivier Giroud getting sent off. I know he went over the ball, but he did touch the ball first. And I think he clearly tried to play the ball, he tried a trick, didn't quite work, it wasn't a bad foul, it was a bad enough foul to get a yellow but the red card has to be rescinded in my opinion, obviously the pundits have all come out and said that it shouldn't happen, although they've admitted most pundits, I'm trying to think who it was, but anyway, a lot of pundits have said not just one that, um, that really um, Olivier Giroud's red card should not be rescinded despite it being harsh so where's the logic in that? Somebody better let me know about that because I didn't understand. I'll tell you something else that wasn't logical. Why can't we play against 10 men as well as we play against 11 men? I know there is that factor. 10 are harder to play against than 11. But it shouldn't be that way when you're a passing team like Arsenal. 
The amount of sloppy passes, this is interesting to me at least, the number of sloppy pass, passes um, committed by our team was quite astounding. Um, five by Rambo, perhaps no one's really surprised by that. About three by Kazola, two by Rosicki, who didn't get involved enough for my liking, two by Theo. Um, so ultimately, that's why we don't do well against 10 men. If we start getting sloppy, if we start thinking we've won the game when we haven't, then that kind of thing's going to happen. So I want him to cut it out. Obviously, Arteta, um, he's a shining example of how not to give the ball away needlessly. Um, my good old friend, Nacho Monreal, he his passing wasn't sloppy, but he did get caught in possession and nearly cost us a goal. So needs to cut that out as well. But we've got to be pleased with the three points, particularly away from home against Fulham. No matter how we got those points, they're in the bag now. Um, and obviously at the moment, we're sitting pretty uh, as far as the league table is concerned. Let's hope we are come the end of the season. I don't want to get too carried away right now. Um, but Manchester United, if we beat them, I think I think we're in pretty good stead. And we certainly should do better than, than predicted by me. Uh, so aside from sloppy passing and, and another three points, what else have I got to discuss? I said, looking at my my very uh, rough sheet of paper. Well, the managerial situation, let's talk about that first, because obviously Arsene Wenger out of contract 2014. There's talk now of a successor by the name of Joachim Love, or Lo, is it? I don't know how you pronounce it. Love. Love sounds better, doesn't it? Dr. Love. Um, well, he could be coming in. And um, if he does, um, Gazidis and Kroenke apparently have already been in preliminary discussions with Joachim Love about the possibility of taking over from Arsene Wenger. The reason being is not that they're unhappy with Wenger, it's just that they need to plan for a successor should Wenger decide to up and leave or, or should the board decide eventually that, that Wenger's not up to the job anymore. So that's that's one, one thing that possibly could happen. It's not out of the realms of possibility because Joachim Love, of course, is leading Germany to the World Cup uh, finals in Rio. 2014 they'll be over and Arsene Wenger's contract will be over so you can see why you can see why the um, the journalists have come up with this possibility but they have mentioned Kroenke's name as as they've also mentioned of course Gazidis's name so I, I kind of get the feeling there's some there's something in this story but it's only preliminary discussions at this stage nothing's done and dusted not at all um, the other managerial switch that might happen um, I find this a little bit dubious, but again, it's remotely possible. Steve Bold could return to his former club, Stoke City, this time in, as a manager, for Tony Pulis, who's been under fire lately. Of course, Tony Pulis did get a win at the weekend. Stoke safe from relegation, but nonetheless, the Stoke City fans have had enough of Stoke Pulis, it, it appears. Uh, Stoke Pulis, Tony Pulis. So it looks like he could be on the way, and if so, could be Steve Bold taking his place. Steve Bold, apparently fiercely ambitious, and at the moment... It's been said that Arsene Wenger not the best delegator in the world. Therefore, Steve Bold wants to go out on his own. He certainly wants to be a manager one day. Will he stick around and wait for Arsene Wenger to, to leave the club as manager and take and take that position? Um, we shall see. My I suspect, again, I suspect that Steve Bold won't be Arsenal manager unless something really dramatic happens at the club. I don't see him becoming manager. Um... I think he could be a good manager, though, for whoever he does eventually manage. But I don't know. The more I talk about it, the more I suspect he, this, there is there are legs in this story and that he could be going going to Stoke. I hope not, because because I, I like having ex-Arsenal players at the club, particularly as managers. Obviously, Arsene Wenger's been most successful, and he's not an ex-Arsenal player. But hark, I hark back to the days of George Graham. I still I still miss I still miss old uh, old stroller, as we as we used to call him. Um, another arrival, possibly, I was talking about Joachim Love a little while ago, but on the on the player front, could be Julian Draxler. £15 million pounds he's going to cost. He's a teenager, plays for Schalke 04. Real Madrid also interested in this um, attacking prospect. That's what we tend to sign, right? Prospects. And what they were saying um, on, um, on a TV programme about football, they were saying that Arsene Wenger now likes to uh, likes to likes to raid the Bundesliga for his talent but I was thinking he also likes to raid La Liga as well so I'm not too sure where they were going with that one I think it's a combination yeah it's true in the past he used to raid France and I think 
Now that's Newcastle's hunting ground when it comes to transfer activity. Ours tends to be Germany and Spain. So yeah, there is some possibility then that perhaps we will sign uh, Julian Drexler. Um, if anybody knows any more on that, do drop me a line. And um, the other thing I was going to talk about, Jack Wilshere. Well, it looks like he's going to have ankle surgery in the summer to replace a pin in one of his ankles. And, uh, well, we can only wish him well. Let's hope he's not out for a long time. Um, just before I start talking or, or reading, should I say, about Peter's story, would like to mention Andre Mariner, who was the referee, of course, that sent Olivier Giroud off. Um, wasn't the best performance, was it? I'm thinking he's, man he's going to be referee in the FA Cup final. I wonder how many players are going to be left on the pitch. He's now sent off five players in five games. Doesn't bode well for the FA Cup final. Not that I really care about it that much, but just just thought I'd throw that to you anyway. And of course, on that very subject of Wigan, who are playing in the Cup final, of course Wigan are taking on Spurs next, so, so up the Wigan for a while. Right, let's move on and read from this book I discovered. Got it on the cheap. Charles Buckins Football Monthly. And it's all about Peter Story. Determination plus flair equals Peter Story. So a bit of maths for you. Peter Story's iron resolution and all-round talents made a massive contribution to the cause of Arsenal this last season. This was written June 1971, by the way. Um, if you use just one word to describe his game, it would be determination, in capital letters. The sort of gritty determination that has turned an England-class fullback into one of the best midfield men in the business. The steely dedication that can turn a cheerful character off the field into a cold-eyed enemy on it. Such intense determination was perfectly illustrated in that epic FA Cup semi-final at Hillsborough when Arsenal were awarded a last-minute penalty against Stoke City. The agonising face-to-face confrontation between the Iceman story and England, I think it says ace there, England ace Gordon Banks is unlikely to be equaled for dramatic impact for as long as the 55,000 partisan witnesses will remember. As Story, outwardly resigned but inwardly restive, stepped up to beat Banks with his dramatic spot kick, a huge cheer signalled relief and uh, released um, Arsenal's all-action midfield man from a responsibility that few would have envied and fewer still accepted, as Arsenal manager Bertie Mee admitted. At a moment like that, I couldn't think of a player I would have rather trusted with the task. I'm not too sure he spoke like that, but... Let's go with it. Anyway, skipper Frank McClintock echoed the, the admiration of his boss when he said, and you're going to love this accent, Peter was on a heading to nothing and I would have forgiven him if he had asked to be spared the ordeal. But no, that's not like Peter's story. He stepped straight up and ended the unbearable tension by slotting home the equaliser. It was agony for the rest of us and I dread to think what it must have been like for Peter. But he just accepted the situation. Story himself admitted. Yes, it was quite a moment. As soon as Mahoney handled the ball and the ref pointed to the spot, the lads went potty. Some were leaping and shouting, we've saved it. It was all right for them. I still had to stick it in. I knew I'd be either a hero or a mug, so there was only one way to settle it. I ambled up and belted it. But it seemed to take three hours to get into the net. Arsenal manager Bertie Mee once described Peter as the perfect professional. Peter Perfect. That's wacky races, right? No one who was at Hillsborough that day will ever argue about that. He has also been described by some as a hard nut. No one who has ever come out of a 50-50 tackle with Story will deny that either. Yet to think of Story as merely a hard man is to dismiss his many talents and his undoubted temperament for the big occasion. Colleague George Armstrong quickly dismisses the suggestion that his teammate is just a hard man whose only contribution to the side is in his tackling. Says George, and I can't do a Georgie accent, so maybe I'll just give up on that. Peter is a very underestimated player. He's a bloke who... Let's see, I'm trying anyway. He's a bloke who gets on with his job because he relishes it. He's made a great success of his midfield role this season because he's utterly determined not to let anyone down. In the process, he's proved that he's quite a footballer. He's got quite a bit more skill than people give him credit for. He played a blinder at Hillsborough and he did us proud when he took that penalty with so much at stake. Peter's ice cool in a crisis. He's got nerves of steel. No one wants to take a penalty in the dying seconds of a game, especially a cup semi-final when you're 2-1 down. But Peter kept his head and he slotted it away. What of the accusations that Story is just a hard man who sorts people out? 
Utterly stupid, insists Armstrong. Peter's tackling and his timing of tackle have always been superb. He's hard, but he's definitely not vicious. He's not in the team just to sort people out. He is a very good marker, as George Best will testify. <laughs> I'm sort of thinking about the marks on George Best's legs. That's what he means by marker. That's what I'm thinking. He's good because he gives his, he gives every job 100% plus. It's always difficult. I know, this is our football parlance. So everyone has to give 110% effort. Which sort of gets on my nerves, really. I'm not a mathematician, but still. I always thought 100% is, is the max. Anyway. He, but he doesn't hold grudges or make threats. He can look after himself on field. But he doesn't cry when he gets knock, and he gets plenty. Peter accepts this like true professional. I can tell thee that he gets there. He gets more than his share of them. That's because he's fearless. He doesn't need wear pads, and he doesn't need pull out of tackles because he's a hundred percenter. Off the field, he's a bit quiet. You don't get much out of him. He's got very keen sense of humour, and he lets himself go a bit after games. Perhaps his greatest asset is his tremendous enthusiasm for the game. He even shows out in training, he gives it everything he's got, just as he does when he's out there on field for Arsenal. He really deserved his call-up to England squad for his great displays last season. One thing you can be sure of, he'll never let England down, no matter where they play him. Well, they didn't play him enough, obviously. He only got a couple of caps, I think. I think he deserved a lot more. England colleague Bob McNabb, who also didn't get as many caps as he deserved, Peter's closest friend at Highbury, also pays unstinted tribute to the performances of the Superman story this season. Says Bob, I used to think he was a great fullback. No one ever got past him, and I'll never know why he didn't win an England under-23 cap in that position. He went into midfield originally to win the ball, but now he's doing a lot more than that for us. His accuracy in passing and his non-stop enthusiasm has given us something that given us something extra in midfield. Sure, Peter's a bit of a hard man, and anyone who complains about his style of play, to my mind, is not criticising him as much as complimenting his effectiveness. And what about the goals he scored? Most of them have been pressure goals and have been and have again proved Peter has the ideal temperament to make a success of his new job. Yes, the continuing progress of Peter's story is one of the main reasons why Arsenal have done so well this past two seasons. His drive and dedication is now an integral part of the side, just as the fiery leadership of Billy Bremner has added a new dimension to Leeds United's rise in the past few years. Players like Bremner and Story have had to break down a few barriers to be accepted in the fullest football sense. They are loved and hated, depending on which side you support, but they are never, never left out of the side. Peter Story is winning himself a lot of fans for the flair and skills he's added to his game, but the game will always be the same for Story himself. 90 minutes of all our effort written by ray bradley quite a nice quite a nice piece i, I enjoyed reading that and it's the first time for me first time for you perhaps i don't know um was it was it good for you as it was for me i don't know i shouldn't ask those sort of questions but until the next time i'll say uh what do i say uh not away that's it away until the next time oh, up the goodness <laughs>